Hi everybody. Um, can you all hear me okay? I apologize for the, uh, the delay. We've been having some technical problems and you've been experiencing one of the rare blue screens that wasn't Microsoft's fault. So um, We'll get this going. There's been some, some audio video issues this morning, so I'll try and get into this as quickly as possible so that we can get through all of my stuff and still hopefully leave some time for some questions and any follow-up discussion. So um, I'm Jeff Thorpe, I'm from, I'm from NXP. I'm here to talk about, uh, I don't know if they're my two favorite topics, but they're certainly the two that keep me awake the most hours per day, uh, Zephyr and in particular IoT security topics um, and, and how these two interact with each other. Um, I think you're gonna be hearing a lot about the Zephyr project at this conference. We got another talk coming up this afternoon by Anas and uh, Ben, who are two of the lead, technical leads in the project. So. Um, if, if you want to get into more detail than what I'm going to be covering here, then definitely go and check them out. Um, you're going to have an, a really good opportunity to get into the bowels of the code and find out just how this thing ticks. Um, similarly, we have a booth upstairs. If, uh, you know, if after this you want some more information about that, we have Kate from the Linux Foundation and other people involved with the project in a variety of uh, capacities. So um, this is where I'm coming from. Um, this, is, this is not my CV, this is really just more my, my prejudice, if you will. Um, uh, I work in the, I head up security in the R&D group at the microcontrollers business unit of, of NXP, uh, formerly Freescale. So uh, this is the, the i.mx and Kinetis um, product families. That, this is generally what I work with. And I'm coming from a hardware, well, largely a hardware background. So um, uh, though I do have a software background, um, our approach to IoT security thus far has been fairly hardware-centric. Nonetheless, um, I'm very interested in this, uh, this Zephyr topic uh, because of what I think this is going to allow us to do and because of what I think needs to be done uh, going forward into IoT based on what we see happening so far. I'll get into that in some more detail. but. Um, First off, uh, the, the topics I want to cover, I want to give you like a, a quick overview of Zephyr, the project itself, just give you a couple of high level items on you know, what it is, why it's there, how long it's been around, and those sorts of general things. Again, there's going to be ample opportunity for people who want to find out more. Um, and then I'm going to dig into my topic, you know, the IoT security su subject in general, which is a, I'll get to just how vague a term that is. but. Um, try and get through some of the things that I think matter most there and hopefully tie that in why I think Zephyr has a role to play. So, um, what is Zephyr? Well, um, for those who haven't been, um, you know, seeing some of the high level items, this really is sort of a, a 50,000 foot view of the project. So this is a, um, uh, this is a small footprint IO, uh, RTOS for, Intended for IoT, but I mean IoT microcontrollers. I mean the two terms are becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish. Um, the one of the characteristics of Zephyr is the fact that the way it builds and the way you construct it um, is relies as much as possible on fixed static allocations. So it's very good for building constrained, um, low footprint images. Um, that's not to say dynamic memory allocation isn't possible, but uh, we harness wherever possible the fact that if you know up front what you're going to need, you can build even smaller, faster images. Um, the, the open source project uh, is, is following the Apache 2 license, um, and this is, uh, this is being run in the context of a Linux Foundation project. They helped us put this together. Um, in, in particular, this came out of uh, Intel Wind River. They somewhat courageously, I think, um, realized that the best future for this, uh, this code base and what it could do was to, to get it out into the open source community and, and, and increase and improve its, its cross-architectural support. So um, we, NXP, and I know a number of the other ARM-based um, semis uh, were you know, a, a pretty enthralled by this and uh, Lenaro has just cre uh, created a new IoT group called Light. For those who are involved in the Linaric uh, ecosystem at all, you've probably heard about that. Um, we're really excited. Um, so there's a critical mass building around this project. Um, and uh, as I'll get to in a second, there's sort of a transparent development model. So we're trying to have, uh, we're trying to have a cake and eat it too, in the sense that yes, we are, um, uh, there's, there, there are corporations forming behind this to try and give it the necessary, um, the mass and the, the solidity. 
but we're trying as best as possible to ensure that the, the open source fundamentals are respected. There's a meritocratic system around the community and anyone can get involved and uh, the ability to write checks has nothing to do with your ability to get involved in the coding process. Uh, right now we cover these architectures, but there's a lot of um, uh, squirreling away going on. Various people are getting involved in, uh, you know, MIPS and DSP and RISC-V and a few other things in terms of potential targets. But right now, this is this is roughly what we're what we look like. Um, and as the Linux Foundation was looking at what it wanted to do about IoT and microcontroller form factors, where, as was pointed out in the, uh, the fireside chat earlier. Um, there's a limit to how far down you can go with Linux. Uh, and, and that's not just in terms of footprint, it's also in terms of uh, you know, latency for certain kinds of tasks and use cases. So when you look at the RTOS um, and IoT microcontroller software ecosystem, th there is a, I mean, everyone and their uncle has written an RTOS, it would seem. And so there's a lot of fragmentation. Um, a lot of these bear the, uh, the footprints of their um, specialist origins. Everyone has come at the Artos problem from, from, from boutique angles. So we have an awful lot of different things out there, but not really anything that could proclaim to be sort of uh, generic and yet have all of the, um, the open source model attributes that we would like to have seen. This was, I think, Linux, excuse me, Linux Foundation's interest in ramping up this new project. And as it so happens, uh, Wind River and what they've been doing for many years now um, with their uh, with their RTOS, um, uh, th this worked out quite well. So, hence, um, some, me some of the motivations for putting the project together. As I will get to in the last point, um, I think security brings another angle to all of this. Um, uh, that sounds like an empty phrase, and many people use it in an empty way, so I will try to get back to putting some substance to that in a second. Uh, as to why you might get into Zephyr, I've pinched this marketing slide, so um, you'll forgive me for not dwelling too much on it. I'm not a marketing person, but um, this is obviously aspirational. I don't think anyone would pretend to objectively to claim to be best of breed of anything, but um, we hope that the, the critical mass that's forming around Zephyr and the fact that it provides an environment where anyone can lean in and try to do what it is they think they need to get done and not face too many obstacles um, means that it will evolve um, uh, to, to potentially be best of breed. And uh, the permissive licensing and modularity and these other attributes, I think, you know, they, uh, they're, they're deserved. Um, and as things stand today, I expect this list to increase, but right now the Platinum members in the project who are sort of backing it and are putting in resources of all shapes and sizes are uh, NXP, Intel obviously were the, the ones that kicked it off first. Um, Synopsys have also joined. And uh, most recently, Naro uh, created in their IoT group um, have also jumped on board and are looking to build their IoT platform um, around Zephyr and to, uh, to utilize um, what we're trying to do here. So just drilling in one level, uh, a simplistic view of the, um, th there is a, uh, there's a charter Linux Foundation tends to run its projects in a fairly consistent way and uh, we're following that. <coughs> So in terms of the governance model, if you want to call it that, the, uh, there is a governance committee there, a governance board, that's where I'm involved. I'm not on the technical side of things for this project, at least um, not enough. So um, you can park me in one of these orange boxes, but the, the true technical activity is happening here in the technical steering committee. Um, and that's where, as I said earlier, we're trying to have our cake and eat it too. This is a, a community model. It's an open source model which is, uh, as best as we can, decoupled from the, from the governance questions about, you know, uh, what conferences are we going to, where, where, you know, for, to the extent that we have budget, what are we, what are we point, pointing that budget towards. Um, any, anyone can get involved in the, in the technical activity of the project and that is enshrined in the way the charter works. So we are trying to um, leverage what seems to be working elsewhere, in particular in the apps processor spaces, so servers, networking, and, and so forth. Um, uh, as I will get to um, in more detail, um, there's some, I think, fairly unique possibilities on the security side of things, and so, um, and that is something being largely 
at least for now, are driven by the, the companies who have jumped in. So that's why we, I've, I've colored these things in orange to try and to capture that distinction. The, the community model really is there in the TSC and all the contributors that join the mail lists, start submitting patches, code reviews, and so forth. Um, the participation. So the, the, the project, uh, the, the code is not new. Um, as I alluded to earlier, um, this code in various forms has evolved over the last 20 years, in fact. Um, uh, Wind River and I, and I think, I'm not sure entirely of what, what predates Wind River in terms of the code activity, but um, this has been deployed in various um, uh, critical environments like aerospace. Um, and so over a long, long time, the project is new, but the code within it is not. And so it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of rethinking going on. A lot of the formative discussions for the project itself are happening right now. We're talking about uh, what we're doing with the IP stack, talking about the different connectivity options, what we have, where we're going, what would work best, and so forth. Um, even to the extent of determining what makes most sense in terms of scope for the project. You know, where would you draw a line as to what's in versus what would be considered accessory? So um, for anyone who cares about this and is interested in getting involved, well, there's, there's something to be gained by getting involved at this point uh, because a lot of those formative discussions uh, are happening now. Um, and so we invite anyone who cares and anyone who has an opinion to come share. And, um, uh, and, I, and I think there's plenty of room for people to, to scratch their itches. Um, uh, I showed the slide a week ago, um, and it was only at that point as I was, as I was showing it that it occurred to me that um, open source developers already have an unfortunate reputation as being hairy and, and, and of, of poor bodily uh, hygiene. So um, that was certainly not the intention of the slide. Um, uh, we do hope that people will find that there is the um, what's already there and where, we, where we're going and how this project works will allow you to, you know, there, there's a lot of weird um, applications and use cases for microcontrollers and so we expect that this, um, uh, there's sort of an inflection, if you will, in what's going on in that industry far more so than mature markets like servers where you know, if you look at the Linux kernel right now and all the subsystems and the driver models and so forth, things are fairly mature, things are fairly stable. Uh, you see a lot of incremental th changes, but people are not ripping it apart and reconstructing it from zero. That's not true in microcontrollers right now. So we, we're aware of that. We're hoping that um, ourselves and anyone who wants to join will be able to lean in and actually have fundamental influence on what we can do. So if you have itches, scratch them. And of course, if that um, fails, we'll then get some treatment for some fleas. Um, the IoT security topic. So I, I always get a little bit um, vertiginous when I am asked to talk about IoT security because it seems everybody is already trying to talk about IoT security and the air is kind of thick with nonsense on the topic. Everyone is, is, is saying all sorts of um, things um, of various degrees of ludicrousness. So. Um, I'm going to try and drill in a little bit to what I think we mean by IoT security and what I think matters and then tie that back to Zephyr. And so um, first of all, I guess uh, the question to be begged is, well, what do we mean? Um, and we should start with the first term. So, so one de fact is IoT. Um, the, the experience I've had um, working within my employer and indeed working in, you know, in the ecosystem, going to various conferences, working with partners, just, just talking and, and, and more than anything listening, is that if you ask 10 people what IoT is, you're going to get 10 answers and probably none of them is terribly satisfactory. Um, most of the time, the dialogue around IoT is dominated by a, uh, a product-centric view. So you find people describing IoT in terms of markets, verticals, standards, form factors, use cases, and so forth. But ultimately, that is a, a very business and product-centric view of IoT. And what you do find is if you then drill into the software detail, you find that that's, those become fairly artificial distinctions. What you would, by any of those criteria, call IoT versus what you would call not IoT are more or less in software, uh, they're, they're the same problem. So I think those distinctions uh, are somewhat, um, unless you're on the business side or you're, you know, you're trying to explain something to an executive, I, I don't think that kind of uh, phrasing and that kind of nomenclature is, is the right way to, to talk about IoT. For us at least, um, in, in the engineering world, programming world, software world, I think it makes more sense to just make the obvious, 
observation. It, it's almost a, a banal observation, which is that IoT really is whatever was previously offline coming online. It's, it's reductionist, perhaps. But I think what's interesting, particularly in security, stems from this observation, and that this is the one that matters. Um, there, there are many things online that have been online for time. I mean, a cell phone, most people don't think of, I've not seen a single slide deck on IoT that doesn't include automotive, for example. But I haven't seen a slide deck that includes cell phones. So I think the point there is that cell phones and, and, and that kind of software activity has already been online. There, there, there's nothing terribly new about that. The fact that your shoes are coming online, that's what's new. And so um, I think this is the key distinction. And then the other part. So what do we mean by security? Um, this, this is this word's even more problematic um, because it's difficult to find and because it gets abused quite heavily. Um, uh, and of course I feel this most uh, security is my role. So um, let's start off by looking for, at a few examples. These are the kinds of, I mean, I'm not trying to look for too much pity, but these are the kinds of sentences I hear every day. And I don't know if you find yourself saying these sorts of things or if you, you, you see this sort of thing going on unnecessarily often. But uh, um, I don't have words to express the scorn for this sort of thing. In fact, I, I, I suggested to my boss at one point that these sorts of things should be a firing offense. Um, he pointed out to me that if that was indeed the, the criteria for a pink slip, then I would have been fired five times by now. So I don't mean to be too cynical. We, I, I do this too. I find myself doing it, and I, I find myself not paying too much attention when others do it. it but I think there's a, a certain discipline required because these all beg that question. Right, what on earth are you talking about? Integrated security, I mean, what do you mean integrated security? What is security in that sense? Um, so, here's just, you know, I, I, I've picked these examples, I could pick, pick an awful lot more, but the reason I've, I've written these down is because these are the kinds of things where I've actually seen people within the same company, sometimes within the same teams, talk entirely past each other. We need, to, we need to have a product with more security, right? That sort of nonsensical sentence where one of them meant one of these lines and the other one was thinking the other. And they, they sailed past each other without realizing the, the, the disconnect. Right? These are all fundamentally security topics. And in many contexts, this is what you mean when you're talking about security. But without context, do you mean all of them? Do you mean some of them? Do you mean any of them? Um, in particular, this last one. Um, I'll get to this in a second, but the complexity in software often gets to a point, and we've discovered this increasingly over the years, that um, the quality of the code is often the difference in security. It's not necessarily about cryptography and confidentiality and privacy and protocols and so forth. But you're often just talking about, you know, how buggy is it? So um, that's to try and motivate a little bit where I'm going. Um, and if I was to dig one level de deeper, and this is still not a complete list, but these two are security topics, important ones, I think. And, uh, and I hope you can get an appreciation of just how vast um, the topic area can become when you don't constrain it. Uh, uh, I get shivers down my spine looking at my own slide. That's, um, I mean, th these are all um, subject matter expertises in themselves. And I, I dare say, I'll get to this in a second, but the, these all apply. If you're talking IoT, there's, there's not one of these that doesn't apply to some extent. Um, some of them less, and some of them more, and some of them increasingly. Certification, for example. So, I still haven't answered the question, um, what is security? I've just tried to point out that most of the usages of it um, uh, are undefined. Um, I think the point here is that security can mean anything, so therefore it means nothing. Okay, so it's a useful mental, mental exercise. I, I encourage you all to try this, is to go into a talk where anyone's talking about something vaguely related to some security topic, and just ask yourself how, how often this, this wording goes past, and how often, you, how often they're saying something where, in fact, they could mean any, any one of a number of different things. Um, it's usually implied by the context, but unfortunately not always. 
And what it means if you have a context varies dramatically. And uh, I've often used this last point when dealing with you know, higher level managers and so forth to try and just clue them into this point that if you want to get an understanding of just how vast and broad and vague the security term is, to, is to turn it on its head, to find it upside down and say, okay, well, it's, it's the absence of insecurity or the attempt to eliminate insecurity, which then begs the question, what is insecurity? But it's much easier to imagine how many different forms, how many different ways in which you can be insecure. It's much easier to gloss over the fact that if you're trying to be secure, oh, okay, people assume that's well-defined. Try and figure out what, what, what you might mean by insecurity, and then you understand just how, how vast that is. So, <clears throat> coming back to the first question, what, so what do we mean by IoT security? Um, sorry, I'm booming. Uh, trying to bring those two topics together. I was reminded, by the way, of, a, of that cliche that, you know, um, uh, an image is worth a thousand words. I, I think phrases like this is the other way around. Right? Um, this is, this, everyone has an IoT security apocalypse story. I'm going to give you mine, but um, you've probably seen a few already. Um, part of the problem is, in fact, that uh, it means an awful lot of things. But I think going back to that previous definition of IoT about the fact that it is the onlining of what you would traditionally expect to be offline, we find that IoT security really is about the kind of fault line between these two types of security domain. I'm being a little hand wavy still with my terms, but perhaps a little less now that I've um, broken it in half. Um, arguably, network and logical security could also be split out, um, as we've learned over the years. Um, uh, in the, I'm, I'm, I forgot to mention earlier, I'm on the, for the sins of my youth, I'm in a team called OpenSSL. You've probably heard of that project. Um, Back in those early days when projects like that were starting out, you know, we assumed what we meant by functional security, if you want to call this second item functional. Then um, functional security was assumed to be man in the middle attacks and things like that. You were worried about the network. So we invented all sorts of protocols and mechanisms and ideas and so forth and best practice to protect ourselves against network security issues, only to discover that in doing so, we'd built ourselves a gigantic mountain of buggy code. And we were then caught up in logical security problems. We were, we were so busy protecting the network link that we had given ourselves uh, an attack surface at the edge. So I'm, I'm aware of that distinction, but I don't want to get caught up on it too much right now. So I've grouped those together. The key point I wanted to get to is that because these are traditionally offline form factors, markets, and so forth, um, we're coming from a world of device security which is to say the microcontroller world is largely hinged on a device security mentality. By bringing these things online, a fairly banal observation, we are now confronted with a very different world of security activity, which is the, the network and logical security. So um, this, all those items I had before on an earlier slide, I've just tried to kind of break them out into two. And this is an inherently um, uh, wishy-washy activity because there are many items that should be on both sides of this table. So don't take it too literally, but as a general sort of attempt to gravitate them to where they feel most natural, I think you can see that there's a lot of topics here that are far more common in the device security world where you're dealing with, you know, logistics, infrastructure, and so forth, and, and secure elements in particular, um, a, a very painfully difficult world that I'm uh, all too familiar with. And then, you know, the network side. And, and by network security, I'm also talking, obviously, servers and, and just apps processes and the far more mountain software stacks that you might think of, you know, with around Linux and so forth. Um, and, and trying to make that distinction here. Uh, things like, for example, emergency response, best practice, um, and so forth. Um, This, this is what worries me most, um, but before I try and break this slide down, um, there was a statistic that was put out by Gartner, I think a couple of years ago, and I, I'm not sure if that's, if their predictions are proving true or to what extent, but in any case, what they had to say, I think, was at least indicative of what we're up against, which is that they were claiming, I think, by 2017 or 18, 50% or more of the IoT edge nodes would be produced by startups that were less than three years old. 
that to what extent that statistic is borne out is, is I think, is secondary. The, the point there is that these, um, there is a proliferation going on. You've all seen the numbers. It's, it's astronomical, and it's growing something close to exponentially right now. Um, and so this proliferation is going on precisely when the companies involved are, are fragmenting down in terms of their scale. Um, we're no longer talking about gigantic multinationals that have battalions of security experts that they can throw at any given problem. They no longer have long NPI processes in which to get everything right and ready, and on which they can always be late in the worst case. We're talking about mum and pop shops and startups of all flavors that, um, you know, the engineers quite often have the idea, they're raising the VC funding, they're doing the pitch, they're doing the demos, they're cleaning the toilets, who knows, they're doing more or less everything. And so, with that observation, that again is my IT, IoT apocalypse story, is um, I, I've tried to break them out as what I call risk multipliers and defense demultipliers. This is really about the, t the attack surface and the ability to bring resources and engineering weight to bear on the challenges. We are, we're talking about a, a kind of wide deployment that would, that would make most um, server vendors salivate. I mean, the, the, the number of nodes people are talking about is just, just, just crazy. Um, and these are all physically and network accessible. My point here being that a $200,000 server sitting in a rack behind you know, multiple layers of network load balancing and defense and what have you has a lower attack surface than the $3 item you can buy at the hardware store. But it's coming online, it's going to have an address, and that attack surface is, it was a way easier target, and it's in much larger numbers. So there's a larger attack surface, and with that comes the high attack incentive. Conversely, this commodity pricing on these items means that those, uh, those kinds of vendors um, and those kinds of products um, uh, are far more difficult to find room in the budget. We want to do a code review, we want to do some more auditing, we want to go out to a third party just to get a bit of intrusion testing or whatever. We're just bringing eyes to bear on security challenges in your engineering is, is much harder when you're scrape, trying to scrape cents off your margins. Or rather, rather adds cents to your margins. Um, so I, I, I dare say finding and fixing the bugs will be hard. Of course, we're also seeing RTOS fragmentation is part of the problem, but it's not the entire thing. I think the specialization of all of these device types means that you have so many different versions of everything. You don't have you know, uh, five or six major Linux distros and maybe three or four popular web servers or mail servers or whatever. You're talking about a huge amount of modification and customization and uh, you, you have a very um, a uh, very deep tree of, of different code variants. Um, so finding and fixing bugs, particularly when they're being coded by people who are trying to find time to do so many other things as well, is, is going to be worse than it was perhaps in some of these other um, computing spaces. The minimization of engineering investment, as I mentioned, and my, my real fear here is that the reactive security, which uh, what I mean by reactive security, if that's not clear, is um, the observation that when something is online, Unlike the device security world, when something is online, things only start to get fun when you deploy. Whereas in a device security world, the job is usually done when you deploy. Um, so reactive security, what do you do? How do you have processes in place? Do you have, can you handle vulnerabilities? Are you involved with the various research communities and so forth for handling these sorts of problems? That's likely to drop down precisely as the devices proliferate. And therefore, we may be inadvertently proliferating a zombie network. So, again, it's, that's an apocalypse story, but it sets the scene. Um, what I wanted to capture here is what I've observed in the device security world, um, microcontrollers especially, is uh, th these types of uh, you know, industrial, medical, automotive, uh, there, there's all sorts of different niche verticals, but these are all um, where microcontrollers are fundamental. Uh, they're non-networked. And there, a huge amount of engineering goes into them relative, for example, to if you, if you took a look at a metric on footprint or lines of code or something like that, um, you would think of these things as being small and simple. But it's, it's staggering how much effort goes into them. Um, and, but it, it's all based on a deadline. I mean, 
you get to a certain point, you have certain kinds of QA and certification and, uh, and, and other checks and balances that you have to go through because ultimately you're done and you ship. The device is offline. Uh, if it's reached a certification in any case, well, there's very little you could do to change it. So the whole question of keeping that thing up to date has is, 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 is never really been a concern in the device security world. And I think that's reflected in, in all the kind of engineering and how you do the engineering all the way up to that point. Um, you don't see the same level of rigor, for example, in many hugely elaborate Linux systems, but that's because as soon as something's found or detected, um, you know, apt get yum, whatever your system is, you're going to be pulling down updates and you're off and running. That's a foreign concept to a large piece of the, the microcontroller community. Um, however, uh, certainly in the higher end microcontrollers, which I would generally prefer to call apps processors, um, uh, the complexity threshold has long since been crossed. Same threshold that you know, microprocessors crossed in the 90s. You know, you see them in your cars now, in your coffee machines, these kind of graphics-rich, Linux-running systems, large SOCs, are running software which is every bit as complicated as what you have on your cell phone, what you have on your desktop. Uh, but we're even finding that in what people are trying to do on microcontrollers, that this is also becoming the case. The, compl the, the complexity of the protocols and the, uh, you know, for example, the, um, the behavioral things people are trying to do, uh, behavioral security ideas, um, analytics, they're trying to push stuff because of scalability problems closer to the edge. Um, the complexity there has far outstripped the ability for people to get something provably secure. Very few people even talk about trying. Um, so there is an inherent problem here, which is that we're engineering in a world that comes from the idea that you get something basically secure and it's done. But we've crossed a complexity threshold where we learned in the 90s that that just doesn't work. It's, it's, an, it's illusory. And of course, they come online now. So uh, this is more than just theoretical nicety, but they're online and in all likelihood vulnerable. So um, I spent a bit of time asking myself this question and talking with a few people um, you know, a few months back, um, particularly with uh, Kate and others who you know, have been looking at all sorts of other kind of software procedural questions. Um, obviously things will go wrong. I don't need to prove that point. The media have already done it for me. You've seen numerous cases, I'm sure, and you won't, you know, that, that's not going to dry up anytime soon. All, things, all sorts of things are already going wrong. You have uh, um, baby monitors, you know, blasting Metallica songs at three in the morning, people, you know, running devices off the road and fill in the gaps. I mean, insulin monitors, heart, you know, pacemakers, everything. The, I don't need to spell that out. But um, the question then is, well, given that this reality has already been confronted and we've been now dealing with it for decades in the apps processor spaces, or, you know, research happens, fuzzing, you know, all sorts of th things progress in advance. And so what you're able to find out about, you know, the things that, that are wrong that you're able to discover about software, in those spaces, you know, they've, they've, they've come to grapple with that problem. You, th you see organizations like the, the different certs, um, first.org. Uh, there, are, there are all sorts of processes and standards for how you embark <coughs> embargo vulnerability information, coordinate fixes, release information, all that sort of thing. That's actually well established um, in, in the apps processor spaces. And so of course you see it in, in the Linux kernel and, and, and in every user space package that you could care to deploy. Um, can we bring that over, right? Is that applicable to the IoT, RTOS, microcontroller uh, arena? It would be nice if it was. Um, hang on, have I missed a slide? Um, sorry, it would be nice if it was. Um, uh, I deleted a slide earlier because of uh, the audio-visual stuff. Um, the problem is that... Um, uh, actually, no, I'll come back to this. First of all, DLM. Um, if you've been to a security conference in the last couple of years, um, you will have noticed that there is hardly a square foot of a trade show floor without a DLM solution on it, right? 
There's all sorts of um, small and large companies trying to pitch different DLM solutions. Um, I wrote this slide in a, in a slightly more cynical moment. I, I, I don't mean to be too um, condescending here. DLM is an important piece of the puzzle, but it certainly is not the answer. And I think there is this kind of, if you'll excuse the pun, there's a sort of a false sense of security in thinking that DLM is in some way the solution to this kind of problem in the, in the microcontroller IoT world. Um, because all it really is is about patch management. How do I get the patches out? What's the, what's the over-the-air mechanism? How do, you, how do you update the flash? How do you do integrity checks? Yada, 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 right? And for many of these DLM solutions, the, you know, the, the rush of blood they have is to try and build a revenue stream off the fact that they're signing your images for you. So they're trying to embed roots of trust. Therefore, they help you by, by having you pay on, a, on some basis for how many images they sign and how wide they deploy. However, if you want to use a network metaphor, this is really the last mile of the problem, right? In networking, we talk about the last mile being essentially, you know, your house or, you know, the condominium block you're in, whatever. But the question is, what's, what's happening upstream? Okay, where does that code come from? Through how many different hands of the supply chain does that code go and get modified? Um, who's doing the work to analyze it and try and find problems with it? As the you know, static code analysis and other things advance, what is being discovered and what do you do? This really is just about once you know you have a problem, you have your fixes, you've QA'd them, you've dealt with your supply chain, you've dealt with all of the jurisdictional complications. This is just how do we sign an update? Which I dare say is, um, to put it mildly, is, is not really a complete solution. Many people think it is, and uh, the trade show floor is littered with these solutions, so you're kind of left with the impression that it might be. So again, reactive security is well understood um, over in these areas, and can we adopt them? Well, there are some significant complications as it turns out. Um, for those of you who are familiar with, um, with this topic, uh, well, if, if you think of a, of a conventional Linux distribution, you've probably seen with things like wireless firmware as just one example, um, where you're talking about a product, uh, which may be a server or whatever, but you're, you're talking about a system with a host operating system. Linux being an obvious example, there's a kernel, and then there's usually a kernel package, obviously, or perhaps a few kernel packages handling headers and whatever else, but you have a horizontal array of packages. You have a package management system that coordinates them, and anything weird about your system, any kind of intelligent subsystems, any embedded microcontrollers, any, anything smart down under the hood that sits below that operating system level tends to just get representative as, as an opaque package. So you would have a firmware package in your package management system. Um, however, what we find is this phenomenon which is sometimes been described as systems of systems. I think you can flip it on your head and think of it as subsystems of subsystems, the other way around. Um, which is that in many cases, those subsystems are themselves fully fledged operating systems, SOCs, um, and sometimes there's a hierarchy there that goes more than one level deep. Um, so if you're trying to track responsibly software and software updates in a system where the product is hierarchical rather than flat, this whole CVE, CPE scheme falls apart. And yet the reactive security community of the world is built around CVEs and CPEs. So there is, I'm pointing this out, this is an unsolved problem, and I'm certainly not meaning to imply that Zephyr has the solution. I will get to what I think Zephyr ought to be doing. But the, I just wanted to, to, to sort of motivate a kind of uh, view of the problem here. And in particular, the, what we see, for example, with our product line, we have very, very small product microcontrollers all the way up to very elaborate SOCs, is that what is one product operating system, small Cortex-M, for example, um, is in another product is a subsystem of a subsystem. So we are trying to talk about the fact that there is a, there's an RTOS there that we need to track and, and, and provide reactive security for, and yet, CVEs, the CPE notion there, which is the common platform enumeration, the platform is essentially a product. 
So you're trying to track what products are affected by what. We're pointing out here, well, what is one product's operating system is another product's subsystem. And if they're running similar software, what do you do about that? How do you track it? It, it starts to fall apart. And so I think if you go back to the Linux example, you start to see that we were surviving with this scheme. It was starting to show some cracks, but it was still OK. Um, uh, and the closed sourced OSs use this as well. I mean, uh, Apple and Microsoft and all those others are involved in the CVE community. But um, they've been getting by. I, I don't think we will. And finally, uh, uh, a non trivial complication is that. Whereas in those apps, processors, and, and larger operating systems, the supply chain, I, I think, is much easier to handle because the supply chain ten generally tends to be additive in the sense that if you go from some raw, generic, upstream distro all the way through the different specializations of the supply chain, you're typically adding packages or you're adding configuration. You're making tweaks that can be represented as packages. So... The whole question of saying who's affected by a given problem is an easier question to ask and it's an easier question to answer than it is in the microcontroller world where things tend to be transformative. The supply, the supply chain is not about adding packages that do configuration and tweaks. It's about fundamentally transforming the software as you go down the line. The, the, top, the software tends to get ripped apart, put back together, different components get bundled in with each other. The configurations are often, often uh, in, inseparable from the code. Um, and so when you look at a supply chain all the way down through, you know, regional down to, you know, local office type things and all sorts of specialization occurs between provider and edge node, that the relationship between downstream and upstream has become much less clear than we're used to in the apps processor space. So all of these mean that we can't just drag and drop what we've been doing you know, in Linux and in, and in the larger operating systems and expect that we suddenly have a solution for IoT. <sighs> and I don't have a good following slide for that, by the way. That's the end of that topic. I just wanted to, you know, um, uh, lay a little bit of the groundwork. Um, certification is another topic that's coming up. Um, again, you've all seen the hacks. You've all seen the nastiness. Um, you, you probably are suspicious of, of what your next shoe is going to do. Um, that is not going to be tolerated for long. I mean, the signs are already there that sooner or later, people who may not understand this, they're still going to want, you know, want something better to be done. And what has always been done when people want something better is certification. So, um, and by certification, I'm not talking X509 certs and things. I'm talking certification and the kind of like common criteria and FIPS and procedural stuff like that. So um, there are a few different tentative um, attempts by various groups to propose certification standards for IoT. Um, they are uh, undoubtedly valiant attempts, but I think they all suffer from essentially the same problem, which is that they're still anchored in that old device security world. It's a different mentality to get out of, which is that they are certifying um, they're certifying IP, they're certifying hardware, and they're certifying software, as it is. And what that means is you, come up, you have a standard which doesn't take into account how you built the software, nor do you take into account what you're going to do with it once you deploy. It's not about the maturity of software development and continuous development. It's really just a static picture, and that means that it's allergic to change. All the certification standards um, are allergic to change. They are, they're, they're, they're fundamentally based in the notion that you have to get it right, and once you get it certified, that's your badge, that you don't need to change anything, and indeed you can't change anything. Of course, once we come online, most of you from the Linux world, if you are from the Linux world, will know that um, that's in fact a surefire guarantee for insecurity. If you give me something that you think is secure and you walk away, it's insecure because you've walked away. Uh, if you're not going to keep it up to date and you're going to put it online, I don't want to know about it. So certification has never had much traction in servers, networking switches, and all of these things because they know. It's much more secure to keep the thing up to date than to get some kind of false sense of security from a badge. So um, uh, the something about the solution to this, I think, will have at least this attribute, which is that we will, 
we would be certifying not necessarily the software, but we would be certifying some aspect of how it is that you build the software and how it is you intend to maintain it going forward. Questions of provenance, questions of escrow, of keys, or any other kinds of things like that that would prevent responsible maintenance ought to be part of a, an IoT certification scheme. Now, we have a bunch of certification people um, who have more familiarity with that old world, but they'll, they'll, they'll start to look at this, and there are a few discussions going on. Again, unsolved problem. Uh, I won't go any further with this because there is nowhere further yet to go. But I just wanted to point out this is another pain point that I think people aren't paying enough attention to. Uh, they're too caught up in building software and, and trying to call it secure and then pretending that it is. So where does Zephyr fit? Well, this really is my hobby horse. Is I think what we're trying to do with Zephyr is to bake into it. Uh, well, actually, first, let me just, uh, and I'm running short of time because of our uh, technical issues. So you'll forgive me for sailing through this. But this is a, tip, this is a picture of a typical certification workflow. You have an upstream code base. Um, it's trucking along, some mainline development, whatever. And someone downstream with the money and the reason to do it is trying to have a certified version of this. And I'm using certified in the most general possible sense. What I really mean is hardened. So whether you're talking about certifiable versus certified, whether you're talking audited or auditable, whether you're talking about safety standards, compliance, there's a whole ver pick your term. But the point here is a slower moving, because it is necessarily slower moving development, which is hinged on meeting certain harder requirements, um, is that this is done downstream, which means that the upstream development model has absolutely no kind of feedback loop to constrain it to encourage this delta to be small. So whatever work it takes you to get that thing certified or audited or whatever is going to presumably be repeated, and it's not necessarily going to get any better with time. And of course, the merge complications that stem from that uh, mean that you're going to do this very infrequently, which comes back to my other point about the fact that, on the contrary, you should be doing it very frequently. So that's why we in the Ziff project are trying to work on something along these lines, which is we're kind of trying to bake the hardening process, or at least a subset of it, into the tree itself, or into rather into the project, not into the tree. We, we see it necessary, nonetheless, if we're going to have a vibrant open source development community to keep that up upstream mainline trucking along at full speed. Um, as much as possible, we need to find ways not to slow that down and to place obstacles in its path. But the feedback loop from whoever is doing the hardening and whoever understands certification and these other issues to inform them of what they can change with impunity versus what's going to cause us a world of pain is going to be our attempt to constrain that difference so that the upstream is itself inherently hardened to some extent. And and requiring less of delta. Um, and this be something that we can, because it would be into the development process itself, is therefore something that will be more continuous and less periodic. That's the aspirational thing. The idea here is that that's what the security group is looking at, and we're going to try and find a way of working with the, with the upstream community in the project to make that happen. Um, if I was to summarize quickly, the, uh, the idea here is to try and keep that upstream production worthy. And, and this, I think, is one of the key distinctions between what we're doing and, and, and the, the millions of other RTOSs out there, is that they are largely still working on a throw-it-over-the-wall model, right? Whatever their merits, to a large extent, you're taking it, and then you run off, and you do your product, you do your application, and you and the upstream have ceased to be coupled. So whatever's going on upstream and whatever's gone downstream into that product is much more difficult to reconcile with time. This is something we're trying to tackle head on. And we want Zeph, whatever these other things emerge, I talked about certification challenges, I talked about the network security challenges, the vulnerability handling challenges, whatever needs to happen there in IoT, we want Zephyr to be a living, breathing example of what we think the best practices are. So we're going to try and engage in these activities directly rather than just as an afterthought. Right. Thank you very much for your time, and don't forget to scratch.